Hi, I'm Brandon Briscoe, and welcome to another episode of The Postscript, Living Faith Bible Institute's weekly podcast and YouTube series devoted to interviewing pastors and professors from LFBI and across the Living Faith Fellowship. And every time we come together, every Monday, we are having conversations with pastors and professors about topics of interest such as theology and church history and ministry, and all these things are intended to edify you and give you a a glimpse of some of the things that we're teaching in the Bible Institute uh, to give you an idea of who we are uh, as a a school, uh, what our professors are teaching, and where we stand in terms of the Word of God. Now, one of the really fun things that we've been doing on the show lately is a series of episodes that we're referring to as unknown missionary episodes, where where we're talking about missionaries uh, that that very few people have heard of. There's really famous names in the mission world that that get referenced quite a bit, but then there's also these names that that don't often get brought up, and they're kind of in the in the the archives of of missions history. And we've decided to go dig out those names and, and to tell those stories. And in order to do that, we've invited Pastor and missionary uh, James Fife, uh, former missionary to Southeast Asia, and the missiology professor here at the Bible Institute uh, to talk about this. And this week, we're going to be addressing a man named Henry Knott, a British missionary uh, to Tahiti. And uh, and so we're going to turn to James and say, welcome. Welcome to the show, man. Good morning. It's always good to have you on. Yeah, it's always good to be here. Uh, these these have been a lot of fun, and mm-hmm. we get, we're getting a lot of good feedback from people especially missionaries and church planters who are encouraged by these stories. Oh, good. So um, I'm excited about this, and I'm, I'm looking forward to talking about Henry Knott. Uh, tell us about who he is a little bit and mm-hmm. give us an intro about his early life. 1774 is, is when, when he was born. Is when he was born. So, yeah, so we're okay. going back a few hundred years. That's really about the time of the Revolutionary War, to put it in perspective. Yeah. Right? We're becoming a nation. Yeah. Um, so we don't. I don't know a whole lot about uh, his upbringing. He's in. He's in the, in Britain. Uh, he's in a Christian family. He gets exposed early to the idea of, of foreign missions. He gets exposed early to uh, the Word of God and the Gospel. Uh, he gives his life to Christ uh, at a young age. Typically, life started earlier. You know that you know, our 14, 15, 16 year old kids are. Those are grown men. Trying to figure out how to play video games still. Yeah, here, here, like you're a boy until you're about 25. They can't even get their underwear on (laughs) fresh every day at 15 now. But yeah, I mean, they were, you know, they would start into a trade, into an apprenticeship in Mm -hmm. their, you know, their mid late teens. So, um, so life began a little earlier, and so typical of that time. That's that's who he was. He was a bricklayer by trade. Uh, He had an apprenticeship and had gotten into that role. But also he heard um, from William Carey, you know, so very famous missionary. Mm-hmm. William Carey was casting a vision and, and, and really challenging all of kind of the church across England. And he actually, William Carey himself, had a vision for Tahiti. He had a prayer and a desire uh, to go to Tahiti. And as we know from history, he didn't. Right. He ends up going to India. And but... Uh, but Henry not heard that, and uh, you know something about that resonated with him, mm-hmm. and he just latched onto that vision. And so, in terms of you know, kind of before the the missionary days, uh, I don't have a whole lot of the details. Well, we know he became a bricklayer, and we know that he he heard the vision cast by William Carey. Yeah, but he got on a boat, and he ends up getting on a boat. But I would say, you know, that I think that's uh, you know an important point as well. Even the role of William Carey, the mm-hmm. role of men who catch a vision. Uh, and, and are passionate, and the need to have those men even today yeah. in our churches, or you know, in this kind of setting, in the fellowship, where where we have people who have a vision that and an, uh, that's bigger than themselves, mm-hmm. uh, that they're they're just putting it out there and saying, "Hey, you know what? God's God's heart is for the nations, yeah. and we need somebody to go." And if you know, William Carey's point all along was, "If no one else will go, then I will." Yeah, right. If no one's going to India, then I'm going. Right, and we've talked about this before. No yeah. one was going. Exactly. There were there, the missions movement in Europe didn't exist. It was non-existent. Yeah, and so William Carey really propelled uh, Baptists in particular to consider consider the call to the nations. Right, mm-hmm. and uh, mm-hmm. and so he was a huge influence in that way. And I, I think you're right. I think things like mission focus, right, 
And these events that we hold where we invite missionaries in to share their heart, to sh- talk about the field, mm-hmm. is critical because the God's honest truth is that young people need to hear the call. Mm-hmm. This is the way it's always gone. Young people need to hear the go- call the same way Henry Knott did. Right. They need to, to see something that's bigger than themselves. And before they get tethered down to this world, they need an opportunity to say yes and, and start mm-hmm. planning to, uh, to go. Yeah, and, and and combine that with just uh, an understanding of the state of the world, right? If you have you know Doug Pearson showing up and telling you what it's like in Vietnam or in the Philippines or Cambodia or wherever he's at, and mm-hmm. you can that's for a lot of people that's so far outside of just their understanding and even what they recognize of the world. We can get so focused just right here. So mm-hmm. having your eyes open and, and getting a, the ability to see the field, um, the world, and the state of the world, I think it's it's critical. Mm-hmm. We need guys like Doug to come around and, and tell us what's going on. Right, and we right. need Mission Focus. We, we need Jeff Bartel to come in here and, and share you know his experiences and and where he's been. So yeah, absolutely. So that's exactly who uh, William Carey was and influenced uh, Henry Knott uh, into that. So Henry Knott ends up yeah, as you said, he gets on a boat. Uh, he's about 22, 23 years old at this time. Yeah. The Duff is the, the boat's name is the Duff. Did you, did you notice that? Which is the, the famous beer the from beer the Simpsons. The beer in the Simpsons. Yeah, that's yeah, all yeah. I can think yeah, of. That's, yeah, that's all I can think of too. <laughs> I wonder if they knew that. <laughs> I don't know. They Probably not. But he got on the Duff. He got on the Duff. Yeah. As a, and as a young man. Mm-hmm. I mean, again, you know, he probably got serious about life in the Bible when he's 15, 16, but he's only 22, 23. Mm-hmm. He's going, as everything was in that time, on a long sea journey that fairly frequently resulted in death. Like, not everybody got to their destination. Getting mm-hmm. to Tahiti is still a big trip today. Um, but you're talking months yeah. on a boat. Right. And you spend half a year just trying to get there. Right. So, so he gets on the duff. Uh, he sails to Tahiti in 17. And he's with a team. He was. Initially, yeah, he had a large team that went with him, so a number of people caught the vision. And um, they take a group uh, of men, some men, mostly single men, some some families, some young married couples, but mm-hmm. they head off to Tahiti, trusting the Lord to go and to plant churches and to evangelize the, the heathens of, of Tahiti. Right. Yeah. So they get there. What year was it that they landed? 1788. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so about 23 years after his birth, they land in Tahiti and they find a disaster, yeah. you know, in terms of just like the, uh, the spiritual state. Mm-hmm. The state of Tahiti at that time was uh, as, as wicked as you can imagine. Yeah, explain that. Explain the culture. The culture. What did they see visually? What were the people like just visually? How were they living but then also explain to us the, the religion and how the religion had mm-hmm. impacted the culture. Yeah. So, you know, if, and when we think about Tahiti today, we think about, you know, beautiful beaches, yeah. the jungle, it's mountainous as well. It's a great tropical destination. All of that was still a reality, mm-hmm. of course, back at that time. So right. landing there visually, looking at the landscape and looking at the place, it's a, it's a place that anybody would want to be. Like right. It's, it's paradise. Um, but the the visual of of the people and the way that they lived was a stark contrast to what they saw um, in nature, mm-hmm. you know, and, and naturally so, um, even in a fallen world, when you when you compare God's creation, oftentimes to the heart of men, you know, you'll see oh, yeah. just this great depravity. Yeah, you can see the beauty and the vastness of of a creative God, and then you see men that and women that uh, at the time were almost continually consumed in war, tribal wars. Mm-hmm. So f- there were a lot of tribes that um, were, were always at, uh, at each other um, that were, you know, what we would think of as native peoples. So not dressed or scantily dressed yeah. uh, or dressed like warriors. Yeah, the way indigenous tribal people would typically dress. Exactly. The stereotype's kind of true. Yeah. yeah. So if you're coming from posh Britain, mm-hmm. I'm assuming it was posh then too. Sure, Britain's what? always been posh. So right. Henry probably had his his knickers, his scarf, and knickers, and one yeah. of those newsies hats. Yeah, and all of that. Yeah, and showed up and finds these people, you know, running around at war with each other, really killing each other all mm-hmm. the time. 
Um, but they had a king, King. Ha, Pum, I don't know Pum, how, how we want to decide Pum, to say this. Pomer. Pomer. We're gonna go with Pomer. Okay, Pomer. King Pomer. All right. King Pomer. Actually, you know, from from a kingdom standpoint, had accomplished a lot in terms of uniting the tribes and cutting down on some of the the intertribal warfare that was happening. He mm-hmm. had created a, a more uh, vast kingdom under a single ruler. So actually, some of that tribal warfare was coming to an end, or, or at least diminishing. Right. It was still in the hearts of the people. Yeah. And some of the other practices that we'll talk about here uh, were absolutely in the heart of the people. But So the team lands. Um, they, they, they meet the king. There's actually another white person on the island. Yeah, this was weird when yeah. I read about this. Uh, there's, two, there's two guys, right? Mm-hmm. Peter and Andrew, which right. I thought was... Kind of interesting, like apostles. Apostles are there. Yeah, but these guys like accidentally landed there mm-hmm. and then just stayed and mm-hmm. just became a part of the mm-hmm. society. Right. Yeah. So you know, in the in the islands down there, Tahiti was dark and Tahiti was uh, was is a wild wild kind of frontier. Mm-hmm. But close by, there were other islands that were more civilized and and were trade trade routes. You know, they okay. they had ports of trade. Right. So a lot of times, the boats would come into that part of the of the world. Uh, these two guys, yeah, apparently either shipwrecked, shipwrecked, or went AWOL and just deserted to Tahiti. They land there. They've been there long enough that they've kind of settled in. They've and learned the language. They've learned the language, so they become an interpreter. They're a resource to Nat and his team of sorts. When they get there, a little bit, yeah, yeah. So yeah, in terms of being a translator, they were. But they were hostile to the gospel themselves, mm-hmm. these two guys. And Peter in particular was was the frequent translator. Um, it said that he was frequently drunk uh, or under the control of some other kind of substance. So he would he would get up to translate for Henry. And of course, Henry has no idea what he's saying, but his spirit, you know, is telling him, this guy's not translating yeah. the message that I'm delivering. And, you know, he was contentious to, towards Henry not. And yet still, you know, it's this interesting dynamic that he hated the gospel himself. He was contentious towards Henry, not yet willing to communicate for him. Mm-hmm. So the Lord still used this rebellious drunk right. at some level right. to get his gospel out. Mm-hmm. Pretty pretty interesting situation. But they, I think it, it felt more pressing for not at this point to learn the language, which he did fairly quickly. I mean, he worked really hard at, at mm-hmm. learning it. Yeah, it said uh, of him for being, you know, kind of a common man, a laborer, that he was actually uh, quite studious and maybe gifted in, in picking up the language. Mm-hmm. Uh, he did learn the language um, quicker than his other teammates, partially because, as we'll talk about, they they didn't stick around. Right. Um, but he learns the language, and he ends up getting to the place where he can preach right. on his own Yeah, is the first step. Now, I, I, learning a language on the mission yeah. field is really important to relating to the people mm-hmm. and to avoid things like this, like the translation issue. Mm-hmm. You don't know whether or not this person's translating, even if they're a believer, right? You might have right. a believer that's that's translating for you, but you don't know if they're translating your theology, your theology, like right. they could be twisting in, sure. which missionaries run into that. Intentionally or unintentionally. Right. You, know, you, right. you really don't even know what level their language is at. You just know that they're ahead of you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that is uh, extremely important. Uh, if you want to plant a church, make disciples, you're going to need the language. Mm-hmm. If if you think that God is calling you to a place for a long term, uh, then you're going to need the language. I think, you know, on short-term trips, uh, on on, dis- on evangelism-focused trips, you can do a lot with a translator. Mm-hmm. But discipleship is heart work. If you're actually really going to disciple, you need to be able to get the heart of the people, and you need to be able to talk about intimate um, you know, the details of life. Mm-hmm. You need to be able to counsel somebody through all of the things, you know, that are coming up in their life. You know, in this context, as we get into it, there's going to be a lot of counseling that's going to have to happen yeah. after salvation. And that requires deeper language. Yeah. We can't actually get the heart and, and communicate the depths of the scripture uh, with superficial language, yeah. So it is critical. So that's that's a, that's a really good side point, I think. Yeah. I think to make. So their worship practices. I mean, other things that he was experiencing in TV, mm-hmm. like what what was he seeing? I mean, there was sa- there was they're making human sacrifices. So that's yeah. how bad things. were. Oh, absolutely. They they are. It is completely 
satanic. Mm -hmm. They they are polytheistic. Uh, they, as you said, they offer sacrifices of all types. They are animistic. They are superstitious. Every you know everything yeah. had power. Everything is a god, and, and all the gods need to be appeased. They had one god that they appeased specifically. Um, by robbing other people, by stealing. Mm -hmm. Like this is the god of thievery. Yeah, it was, a, it was a virtue in their society was right. your ability to steal things. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, once they landed there, uh, initially not in his team, the, the, the locals demanded goods. Mm -hmm. Like give us axes, give us, you know, just tools. Provisionary give us, things. Yeah, all kinds of stuff. And 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 not would give or, or trade those things to them. It was it was a trade initially. They got food in return. It, it did actually help them survive mm -hmm. uh, early on. But uh, you know the people also would just come and break into their homes and steal. And yeah, it was a it was a value yeah. in their culture. Like we're being blessed by the the god of thieves. Yeah, with the ability to, to steal from to take you. your stuff. And if you come and steal from me, then. Apparently, the god of thieves likes you more. So there was that. Um, yeah, human human sacrifice. Because of all the wars that were going on, they were frequently, you know, they were barbarous, mm -hmm. just extremely vicious in the way that they practiced war. Um, but they were not merciful at all to a vanquished foe. Um, everybody was was offered as a sacrifice. They would offer their own children. Yeah, uh, as sacrifice, you know, it was said of King Pomer that you know his one of his wives had had offered you know three or four yeah, of, their, of her own children yep. as a sacrifice. King Pomer had his own altars, you know, to various of his own gods, and yeah. even you know to appease himself, people could offer sacrifice to him. Mm -hmm. I, I remember reading that that one of the things that the natives pointed out to to not was that on one particular tree, two thousand bodies had been hung. Right, mm -hmm. clearly for him that would have been an insane thing to hear. But then also, apparently, one of the, the, the traditions was that if you killed an enemy, that you would turn their body into basically a garment. And you'd, you'd wear yeah. the, the dead body of your, of your enemy. Which yeah. is like, now, despite all that, they actually, you know, in their own way, treated him well. They put him up. They, mm -hmm. they, the, the missionaries had their own home. They, um, yeah, he was given the, the biggest house on the island. But it was kind of under this, um, the, the auspice of, you guys have things that we want. Mm -hmm. We're going to take care of you, but you need to make mm -hmm. sure that you're providing us with the things that we want. Right. And, um, and for a time, that was okay. Uh, you know, they not th th thought that, that, hey, okay, this is, this is how it's going to go. If this is how I'm going to reach the people, that's okay. Mm -hmm. But they weren't getting any traction in the gospel. And not had to come to a moment of realization and he, and he makes this statement. I want you to describe it for us, mm -hmm. what it means. He makes this statement, and in, in, uh, perhaps it was a journal, but it was mm -hmm. a, they had captured the statement that he made, that he wasn't there for a mission to civilize the people. It was a mission of salvation, not right. civilization, is right. what he was saying. Explain to us what that means, and why is that important in terms of our perspective on, on missions? Mm -hmm. Because not every missionary has gone with this concept in mind, mm -hmm. right? The Catholics and, and a lot of the Protestants sent missionaries into the West of the Americas uh, to really with the intention of bringing a, a religious culture mm -hmm. and to civilize the people, right? which was, was the wrong perspective. And it didn't work. Right. It didn't work. So explain to us why this discovery on Knott's part is so important and mm -hmm. why it's still even important today in, in the way that we handle missions. There is a, you know, a, a biblical civilizing or civilization that will take place. Mm -hmm. Of course, there's, there's a transition, a, a change of the heart. Right. As, as you become a new creature, you are going to change the way you live. And that is the right focus. Mm -hmm. And that is, that's what Knott was alluding to when he says it's a message of salvation. It's that, that first and foremost, man has to be changed from the inside. It mm -hmm. has to be uh, a, a, a focus on the soul, right, and the preaching of the gospel. Uh, not was a, a, a simple man, but believed in the power of Scripture. You know, the very first thing he ended up translating was John 3.16, and the first message he preached was John 3.16, and it was actually, you know, John 3.16 that, that broke the heart of the king yeah. in the long run. Right, and so he focuses there. The other side of civilization are the the cultural uh, civilizations that we build, and a lot of missionaries will go and take all of these cultural 
norms and try to first impose them on people, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, we, we want to get shoes on their feet and we want to, we want to cover up, uh, any the, exposed the, body parts. The, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Put a shirt and tie on them. You know, if you're a Mormon, you make sure they get a white shirt and a tie and a name, name badge. Yeah. Right. You know, or, or, you know, and so we, and we need to build different houses because these huts don't work. And, you know, and so we, we try to change all of the wrong parts of culture and, and in hopes that, well, as they become better, you know, then they'll see. Yeah. It's like they want to, they want them to be Christianized in, in quotes, right? Whatever mm -hmm. that means, mm -hmm. right? But they don't necessarily, they're not working to make them Christians first. Right. Right. They're mm -hmm. not, they're not, there's no spirit living in them. There's no reason ultimately to change the flesh. Mm hmm. Uh, because there's nothing driving them from the inside to become right. the character of Christ. Mm -hmm. It's backwards. It's absolutely backwards. Yeah. So it. Yeah. It's it's Pharisaical. It's mm -hmm. let's whitewash the outside, and on the inside they're full of dead men's bones. There's a danger of that even in our culture today, right? In, in our in our churches and good churches, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll expect people to come in and we'll expect a certain level of of of, I don't know, sanctification out of, out of the lost. Right. Like sometimes we're, we're shocked that lost people act like lost people. Or dress the way the world does. Or right. Like, and that bothers us. So we're more concerned about how they yeah. come in and how, and their appearance. Right. So we'll set up church culture and mm -hmm. then we'll try to demand it of the lost before God has ever had a chance to get a hold of their heart. Right. Uh, we want to, you know, to change them, to make sure they worship like us, to make sure they dress like us, to make sure they sit in the pews like us and take notes like us or what, you know, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And the whole time we're forgetting the fact that that lost people are going to act lost. Yeah. Like it has to be a heart work. So even today we try to civilize before uh, salvation instead of putting salvation first. Mm -hmm. So that was uh, either something that, that not just went with or quickly made the shift to right. realizing giving these people tools and, and, you know, better resources is not going to do anything to help their salvation. Right. In fact, they're just taking advantage of me. Yeah. They just show up and say, I need 22 hatchets. Right. Hey, what does one person need 22 hatchets for? Right. Uh, you know, and so that played out, I think, through uh, Christianity. We've seen in other parts of, of the world what are known as rice Christians, Okay. Uh, so, so where, you know, Christians go and give, here's rice, here's, here's food here. And, and then people will respond because they get something from the Christian, mm -hmm. right? So they, they call themselves a Christian. They'll attend the services in order to get fed, but there's actually no change of heart. So in the same way, uh, you know, in that case, yeah, I think we're, we're trying to, to bribe or, or, or to buy some converts and we probably don't do it intentionally. Mm -hmm. You know, that's not the heart. The heart yeah. is probably... To, to meet physical and spiritual needs. Right. But when that, the wrong foot gets put forward and becomes the priority, then the spiritual takes a back seat mm -hmm. and, and it impacts, obviously, the, the growth of, yeah. of a church, of a true disciple. Yeah, that's good. Good, good thing to know and understand. Um, so Nott and his team faced a lot of, of uh, other hurdles besides mm -hmm. this. The supplies begin to diminish. Mm -hmm. The greed of the people there becomes overwhelming. Um, the Napoleonic Wars uh, pay a toll. Explain some of this this other stuff in the narrative mm -hmm. to show really how not had to come to the end of it himself mm -hmm. and really make some hard decisions because his team ends up kind of abandoning him there. Yeah. So first of all, again, with the just the length and time it took to travel, compounded by wars, they were unable to get supplies for uh, about four, four to five years before their next supply load came in. Mm. So they were expecting a, a yearly visit and yearly supplies. That didn't happen. Uh, I think it was over the course of the first eight years, they received supplies and communication twice. Yeah. Um, yeah, so his initial team uh, upon landing, uh, some almost immediately gave up and went to the other island where, where more commerce was happening and just got engaged in local business and just lived the life of you know, a businessman. Mm -hmm. uh, one guy uh, married one of the local women and was soon after murdered. Uh, a couple other members of his team were murdered um, for various reasons, mm -hmm. uh, offered his, and then probably offered his sacrifice. Um, and then, yeah, a couple just saw the, the overwhelming difficulty of, of the place, the darkness of the place, the challenges that were there, and they just abandoned ship. Um, 
either jumped on one of these supply ships or another mm -hmm. ship or somehow they just got out they of there. Uh, eventually it comes to the point where the last few members of Knott's team that are there with him are attacked and are the, the locals are trying to kill them. Uh, they drag him into a river to drown him. They end up getting away They sw and they swim to freedom, but then they just leave like they're done. Yeah. And the only one left is not. So mm -hmm. Henry Knott is left on the island, ultimately alone. His team is, is stripped down worse than Gideon's to where it's just him. Yeah. Let's take a moment right here to hear from Pastor Mike Renault of Living Faith Boston. Hi, I'm Mike Renault, pastor at Living Faith in Boston, Massachusetts. And if you're considering learning the Word of God, Living Faith Bible Institute would be a good place for you. The good thing about LFBI is that you're not just learning from an academic standpoint. You're learning from actual practitioners that do in fact know the book. These are pastors and men who are leading churches, doing the work themselves, since so they can give you a firsthand real life knowledge of what it means to learn the Bible in that context. Some of you may have a call in your life for the pastorate uh, to be a missionary, to serve the Lord in other parts of the world. Living Faith Bible Institute can prepare you in a way that you can be equipped with the Word of God and given practical tools, being held accountable in your ministry right where you're at. If you're interested in learning more or you want to enroll in LFBI, go to lfbi.org. And now back to the show. The recruits that they originally gotten are gone. gone. The ship is gone. It's been confiscated yeah. by the French army. Mm -hmm. um, not is all alone. Mm -hmm. And yet he continues his work. Mm -hmm. And it's still, and it gets worse. It gets worse before it gets better. But he said he he's learned the language at this point, mm -hmm. and he starts working on a translation of the Old and New Testament mm -hmm. into the native language. So he he sets out to do that, and he's successful. Mm -hmm. But that gets that gets interrupted. Um, so the, the 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 transmission of that obviously mm -hmm. it requires a printing press, which he ha ha had right. Um, but explain, explain what happens there. Yeah, so not knew the importance of both the verbal language, uh, so learning it, so we put a high priority on that, and then the written language, mm -hmm. or the written word of God, making sure that God God could speak to the people. So translating the Bible was his, uh, you know, his big, his priority. And we saw that a lot, and we still do. You know, we're still putting the Bible into other languages, but especially in that time, uh, men working extremely hard to get the Bible into the languages of the people mm -hmm. that they went to. Uh, you recently did a, an episode with Randy Foster and, you know, they have a ministry where they're printing Bibles and yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. praise God for that. Right. Um, but yeah, so, so it does get, it gets difficult. He, he starts to get some traction because he's got scripture. He's able to communicate on his own. He's telling the gospel to people. Um, the missionary house gets destroyed, burnt down. His printing press is confiscated and melted down and turned into bullets, you know, so what he was using in order to bring the words of life, was literally turned into a weapon of uh, of of ending life yeah, of, of the death. enemy yeah yeah uh, and so again you know just through extreme hardship um, but he perseveres he he is he is sure that this is the work that the Lord has called him to and he is sure that there is an enemy who hates it and yet in the end he believes that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation even to the chiefest of sinners. Mm -hmm even to these people. And he's sharing the gospel with King Palmer. Mm -hmm. um, and it, by this point, it's uh, there's, there's really two. There's the father and the son. You know, Palmer and O2. O2 is the son yeah. who ends up taking on the title of Palmer II uh, once he becomes king. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, so, so one day, um, King Palmer hears the, the gospel again. Yeah, for probably like the hundredth time. Yeah. Yeah, I think he he actually says it's more like thousand. Mm. He writes that he'd had, if I remember right, like two thousand conversations. Wow, with the king, um, but he was persistent, and finally the the word broke through, and the king, you know, the king recognizing the the righteousness of God and a savior, tells not. He goes, "Well, your God can save a man like you, but your God can't save a man as wicked as I," mm -hmm. and. And uh, not 
quotes John 3.16 for him and tells him it's whosoever will come. Mm-hmm. Like there is no limit to the grace of God. You right. cannot be more wretched than God is righteous. Right. And, and the king repents. And the king comes to Christ. And it's, and it's incredibly powerful because as we've talked about on this show before, that when in a culture that's tribal like this, when the, when the king or someone of influence uh, comes to saving faith, it has a huge, the, the people in that community are so tightly knit mm-hmm. uh, and so identified under the leadership of that authority mm-hmm. that it becomes incredibly persuasive to other people. And that's, that's what happens in this case too. Right. So, so King Pomer had uh, his, you know, a temple that he'd built and it was said that every pillar uh, that they set, they, they was driven through a human as a sacrifice mm. uh, at the, at the foundation and at the roof as they set the roof. So these pillars were, you know, were, people were run through and left there as sacrifices. They built this temple. This is the kind of guy that gives his life to Christ. And then ultimately this guy ends up building a church. You know, King Palmer mm-hmm. helps to build the first church yeah. on the island. And yes, as you were saying, you know, that example. So his example of building his temple did help to lead that entire island into darkness. But then his transformation and his example of, of building a church and surrendering himself, he gets baptized. Yeah. 5,000 people are present at his, at his baptism, right? And they are... Um, submitted to their king, you know, they are tribal in a way that, that we are not. Mm-hmm. You know, modern day Western world. Uh we are very individualistic. Yeah. We're yeah. you know, we're you know. So yeah, so it does. It begins to to have a great impact on the entire uh nation, mm-hmm. on, on the entire people group there. And they start basically taking all of the idols in their homes. Mm-hmm. And these structures, these edifices that have been raised up uh, in order to honor these false gods, mm-hmm. the the altars of sacrifice, all these things, like Old Testament style, they start mm-hmm. getting torn down. Yeah. Um, the high places start coming down. Yeah, they're burning them. They're destroying them. Yeah, they're, they're getting rid of all of their idols. Absolutely. Yeah. And so people are coming to Christ and they're committing their lives uh, to following Christ. And, and it really is the transformation that up to this point, I mean, I, I, he, at this point, how long has he been there? 20 years? Is that correct? How long has he been there at the point that there's Before a, he sees... Yeah, serious it was, change. It was like 22, 23 years. It yeah. Was, yeah. Before, it's a long but, time before you see a convert. Right. So before tons of pain. any glimpse of hope. Yeah, there was no one coming to Christ. Mm-hmm. And all of the pain and all that suffering that he endured, mm-hmm. the persistence involved ultimately was worth it. It was refining for mm-hmm. sure for his own life. But, but more than that, um, it benefited the kingdom of God. Mm-hmm. He, you know, Christ was waiting for a servant that, that was prepared and ready to, to truly be used. And then there was a harvest. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and it speaks to, I don't know if it's fair to say, like they were just, men were built like different. Yeah. Back then, Mm -hmm. like the fortitude that they had, the willingness to stick it out, even if it wasn't in, you know, a spiritual setting, like men just were men. Yeah. There was, there was a a really a great resolve in Mm -hmm. in that, in that time period. I, you know, I've, I've never mentioned this on the show. One of my favorite books is called The Coddling of the American Mind. Mm -hmm. Uh, And it's written by a couple of lost guys, sociologists, psychologists who write about, basically the, the softening of our culture, right? Mm-hmm. Um, the fear, the anxiety, um, the shame, the victimhood, basically. Yeah. The young people, you know, it, the book was was written on the cusp of Gen Z mm-hmm. uh, that we face as a nation. And, and it, that has permeated the church. I mean, there is, there is a greater fear, particularly in men. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a greater comfort. It, we refer to it as Laodicea. But but so many people are concerned about the way that they feel and about their creature comforts that it makes it really impossible uh, mm-hmm. to unless the, the spirit of God moves on a person's life to raise up young men mm-hmm. that are willing to answer the call just just the way that not did mm-hmm. where you know where are these these men right um, they're few and far between. Yeah. You know, and even if I look in, into my own life, you know, when we were taken out of the mission field that we were on, 
there was there was a certain level level of mourning and difficulty that came with it. And I think that's you know absolutely natural. And mm -hmm. We've seen a lot of people that have come off the mission field, maybe because they're getting older, into the career, or for whatever God shifts them. But a lot of times that becomes a, a defining moment in a bad way, to where these people come off the mission field and all of a sudden they they lose their like the sense of God still has purpose for me, and they give up. Mm -hmm. They don't plug into ministry and they don't, you know, and, and, and I worked through, um, you know, the, again, kind of the, the mourning, the loss of these people and this mission and trying to, f again, figure out, you know, where do I fit and what's my role? But then I look at, you read Acts and you see Paul mm -hmm. getting, you know, tossed out of city after city, having to leave places by night and being let down uh, in secret, you know, and you never really see him shedding a tear over it and 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 spending a bunch of time well what if or what next it's like shake off he shakes off the dust and he starts preaching the gospel in the next place he comes yeah. to yeah you know and I, as i was just working through it myself i was looking at that and i'm like okay like just just do some of that yeah like as long as you know to, to some of our own friends and who've been in the ministry and are, and, and are struggling, like as long as you're still alive, like be like Paul, like shake mm -hmm. off some dust and just be like, someone else needs to hear the gospel. Let's start preaching. Yeah. Well, all have forsaken me. Well, all forsook Christ. Yeah. Well, I, I don't know what to do. Well, preach the gospel. You're commanded to do that. Just start with that, mm -hmm. you know. So yeah. that's to me, as much as I just said that was to, to others, like I, I worked through that too. Yeah. And here's a guy who, who doesn't seem to, maybe we just didn't read enough of his journals. I'm sure he worked through it. Yeah. But it seems like he's just like. And it's not like, it's clear from Paul's letters that Paul's feelings got hurt. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's no one saying that that you shouldn't be hurt. Right. <laughs> right. People, you just have people to keep hurt. going. But it, it, who are you doing this for? Mm-hmm. Right. And I think that's the, like, we can't be coddled in that. If we're doing this for man, mm -hmm. man's going to let us down. If we're doing this to be a respecter of persons or to be affirmed or to be seen or to be noted, if there's mm -hmm. any other mingled motives, we will, A, see a diminished return mm -hmm. on our investments, spiritually speaking, but we will also be let down and we will, we will hit the ground hard. Mm -hmm. But if we're doing it for Christ, and we expect that along the way we're going to be hurt and things aren't going to go the way that we imagine. Mm -hmm. But if we're doing it for him, and if souls to us are as precious as they are to him, right? Uh, well, then I think that you can have the the kind of longevity that a man like not had. So mm -hmm. maybe let, let's let's end by discussing his legacy. Yeah. So, I mean, ultimately, when we be look back on Knott's life, what did he achieve? And what we should we see and, and honor and consider, man, um, that's that's the kind of legacy that I mm -hmm. hope to leave behind. Yeah. So in terms of persistence, he, in 50 years of ministry there, returned to England only twice, um, was largely wow. wholly given to what God had called him to, uh, gives his life completely to that. That's mm -hmm. something that we need more of. We need men who will finish the course, and men yeah. and women. We, yeah. You know, we unfortunately, we see too many that get into the later ages and coast, mm -hmm. turn it off. Uh, he opened the door to, to kind of that whole sector of the ocean, the Polynesian islands, that, that area. So once the gospel came to Tahiti, it could spread from there to some of the greater ports and trade areas, and, and that allowed uh, the gospel to get around uh, in, in that island area. And I think, uh, you know, in terms of, of looking at our own lives, this guy was a bricklayer. Like he was just simple. Like a lot of the other people, like William Carey was a cobbler. Mm -hmm. You know, God takes simple people and then equips them. So we can take anybody, no matter what your profession is or, or your role in society, if you're willing to submit to the Lord and to seek him first and his kingdom first, mm -hmm. you, you do need some equipping. You should be an LFBI. You should be studying the Bible. You should be digging. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a, a level of that that is required, but you don't need a PhD or you don't need, uh, you know, a, an engineering degree or any of that. Or or wealth or... or the, right. Because I think a lot of people are like, well, at the point that I retire, I can devote more yeah. of my life. Like they want, they want some sort of backup. Right. Like something that will 
create the security they need. So if, you know, if God doesn't actually work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. I have a fallback. I have a fallback. So, right. In case God can't catch me. Right. I got something else that will. Yeah. This and, will and, do it. And not didn't. Yeah. Not really. He, he didn't. He get, literally gave yeah. up everything. And there was no really, other yeah. than a couple of respites in 50 years, mm -hmm. this was his people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, you think back to, we talked about George Grenfell. And, and he was a mm -hmm. mechanic, and, and that ended up having a role in his life later on when he had to rebuild his own boat. Remember that story? Mm -hmm. But you don't even see any of that for not. Like, there's no indication that he needed even his skill as, as, a, as a bricklayer. Like, ultimately, there comes a place where you have to be willing to lay down all of the exterior, all external, superficial things. Well, what if I'm never an artist again? Mm -hmm. What if I'm never a nurse again? Mm -hmm. Well, okay, God's worth it. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Take take the bricklayer out of me and I'll keep being a preacher. Yeah, the flexibility of our personal identity is super important. Mm -hmm. Like God might want to use the things that you came up with or that you're gifted with naturally or the things that you've learned along. Maybe he wants to use it. Maybe he doesn't. Right. Maybe he wants maybe to just throw maybe. that away and, and, and start fresh. But, maybe, yeah, that was for a season. But who are we? I mean, who, who are we but the servants of the Lord? I mean, yeah. Paul starts almost every letter the same way. Right, he he refers to himself as a servant of Christ. That is mm -hmm. his identifier, and as a person that is covered in the grace of Christ. Yeah, like that's who he is. And beyond that, uh, he's whatever he needs to be. <laughs> right, right, well, whatever the mission requires right. at yeah. this moment. Yeah, yeah. So, man, Henry Knott. Mm -hmm. uh, there's not a lot written about this guy. Mm -hmm. I mean, what we said here is essentially everything that's really known about him. Mm -hmm. We couldn't find anything about his childhood or any of those things. But man, the testimony that we do have is really, really powerful. Mm -hmm. So James, yeah, thank you. Absolutely. Thanks for sharing with us. We'll keep doing these, man. They're fun. You got more in your in mind that, that, oh, that yeah. we can go? Okay. I've got some. All right, good. We'll keep it going. All right. Well, thanks, man. And we want to thank you too for joining us. Uh, as we talked about Henry Knott, um, it's the very beginning. This episode will really is going to come out near the beginning of the fall semester will be just, you know, a handful of weeks into the fall semester. But be thinking about future classes. Uh, we're going to be offering some missions classes next semester. If you have a heart for missions, LFBI has a track for you. If you hear these stories like Henry Knott and you're like, man, I want to reach people and I want to go to places that, 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 that don't have a strong gospel presence. I want to go to the least reached people groups of the world. And, and you're stirred in that way. Um, we offer an introduction to missions, uh, and then we have a track that goes beyond that. That's missions one, missions two, missions three, that are all preparatory. They're all intended to prepare you for the work of the mission field. And then obviously, uh, if you have a heart for the mission, uh, we believe in the local church and we believe that God has given you a structure and you need to go to your pastor and say, Hey, I'm ready to be equipped, uh, for the work of missions. Make that known. Don't be afraid to speak up. Uh, you know, not had this moment with what, where he heard uh, the message of William Carey and it moved him. I like to believe that the next step for him was to go to his pastor and say, hey, this is the call on my life. And that's really what you need to do too. So don't be afraid to do that. Even if you feel like you're not mature enough to go right away, uh, man, to make sure the path before you is, is sure, to trust the Lord for the future work in your life and to have a vision for what God's doing in you, it's good to make those things plain and known to your leadership. But we want to invite you into LFBI. Uh, if you've got questions about our classes, about our program of study, visit lfbi.org. And, and as usual, if, if this show or any of our shows are edifying to you, please share them with your friends. Uh, like uh, this on your, on your, your platform of, of choice. Uh, subscribe and stay in touch with us as we continue to re release these episodes from week to week. But with all of that said, we love you. God bless you. We'll see you again next week for another episode of The Postscript. Thanks for listening to The Postscript. If you enjoy the show, please leave us a rating and review in order to help other people find our podcast. If you value this show, please help us continue creating content by supporting Living Faith Bible Institute at lfbi.org support.